Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the last lecture of our 26th season of Sea Secrets. I'm Ronnie Avisar, the Dean of the Rosenstein School, and it's a true pleasure to host everybody. Uh, this is, in fact, our last uh, lecture of the season, and uh, it's always uh, sad to conclude um, a season. And I hope that you have enjoyed it. We had uh, put the focus this year on some of the issues that uh, the Rosenstiel School is uh, focusing on, trying to address uh, big societal problems that uh, we are facing uh, in terms of uh, uh, food production, in terms of uh, life saving, in terms also of uh, marine conservation and still keep on doing some fundamental research that help us uh, make discoveries that are very useful for the future uh, as it has been uh, for generations before us. <clears throat> this evening, you are going to hear from uh, Daria Akenak and uh, she's from the Harbour Branch Oceanographic Institute next door to us. And she'll be speaking about, or the title of our presentation is Why are there colors in the oceans? So you'll hear again another great lecture that is part of this series. Next year, hopefully, we are going to be able to get back into the normal mode of, those, um, uh, of these evenings, which is going to be in-person meetings in our auditorium. We are, however, uh, modernizing it with a state-of-the-art technology so that we can continue offering those presentations uh, simultaneously for people that uh, do not have the possibility to join us on campus. So I know that uh, many of us have uh, contacted me over the past uh, few months and uh, asked us to be able to continue uh, following this uh, lecture series and uh, we are working on it and uh, the goal is uh, certainly to be capable of doing that as we start our uh, season, 27 season in 2022, in which we are also planning a series of a very, very interesting lecture. Uh, we use Sea Secrets as our main uh, mechanism for the outreach that we provide at the school. And uh, if you have any question about the lecture and you are interested to uh, support or continue supporting this lecture series, we uh, absolutely need that support. This is the only way we can afford uh, to continue doing it. And I uh, ask uh, that you please contact Jennifer Dillon, who is um, uh, working for us at the school as our director of advancement and the uh, Jennifer Dillon uh, email is going to be provided into the, the chat. So you can, uh, you can get that over there. Um, I want to take also this opportunity as we conclude this uh, series to uh, thank our sponsors that include um, our presenting sponsor, which is the Bank of America. And we are mostly, most grateful to, uh, to the support of the bank. We are also supported by the Shepard Broad Foundation, but Bill Galway's uh, three, Sherry Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, the Key Biscayne Life Enhancement Fund, and the John McCann Family Foundation. As uh, has become a tradition now before the presentation of the guest speaker, we ask one of our alumni uh, to say a few words about their experience uh, at the Rosenstein School, as well as describe uh, the job that they currently do. And tonight, it is truly a great pleasure to welcome our undergrad alumna, Tatum Najan. Uh, Tatum uh, is currently a strategic communicator for the World Wildlife Fund. She's based out of uh, WWF's headquarters in Washington, DC. But uh, Tatum is uh, originally from San Antonio, Texas, and uh, is an alumnus of the Rosenstein School, as I have mentioned, uh, where she earned a BA in Marine Affairs in 2018. She was in fact working in our office, in the Dean office, as an intern for a couple of years. 
uh, with us. So we know her uh, quite well and we have truly enjoyed uh, seeing her involved from um, a first year student coming out uh, fresh from the house and becoming a mature uh, adult that is uh, organizing her life and her professional career that is in front of her and looks uh, brilliant. And uh, uh, Tatum uh, participated while well. she was with us, as I mentioned, as an intern in the Dean's office working on communication. But she worked also uh, for the Rescue Reef and the Shark Research Conservation Program. She also spent a semester in the U Galapagos uh, study abroad. So welcome, Tatum. All yours. Hi, everyone. Um, as Ronnie mentioned, my name is Tatum Nugent. And uh, I graduated from the University of Miami with a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in Marine Affairs in 2018. As an undergraduate, I tried to participate in, in, in as many different um, teams as possible. And that included working as an intern for the Office of Advancement, where I helped on a couple different events, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the Ocean Acidification Conference. I also participated as a communications intern for the Rescue Reef team and for the Shark Research and Conservation team, um, which helped me discover what I wanted to do post-grad which is I worked for a year at the Cape Eleuthera Institute in Eleuthera, Bahamas, where I led outdoor educational uh, outreach groups. And we also participated in a sea turtle population dynamic study where we used photo identification to track different sea turtles around the habitats. And it was very cool to get kids involved and get people of all ages out there studying the sea turtles. Since then, I have now uh, gone on to work in strategic communications for the World Wildlife Fund, where a lot of my position is combing together our prog uh, programmatic work with our um, resource mo mobilization teams. So this has included making several different uh, creative content projects that me um, mold together our financial reports and narratives of what's been happening in the field. Um, I would not be where I am today without my experience at the Rosensteel School, and I'm forever grateful for all the memories I have there and all the experience I got working with such an incredible program. Thank you. Thank you, Tatum. I really, um, uh, again, a true pleasure to, uh, uh, to, to see you again this evening. Thanks for participating in this uh, series, really appreciate it. It is now my uh, pleasure to introduce to, him, to tonight's uh, speaker, Dr. Uh, Daria Akenat. Dr. Akenok is an aerospace engineer and an, an oceanographer. She earned her PhD at MIT and Woodsall Oceanographic Institute in 2014. Her research focuses on problems of biological and computational vision underwater. In addition to using off-the-shelf RGB cameras for scientific imaging underwater, she also uses hyperspectral sensors to investigate how the world appeals to non-human animals. Daria has professional, technical, and scientific diving certifications and has conducted underwater field work from the Bering Sea to Antarctica. She is an honorary for the 2019 Blavatnik Awards for Young Scientists in Physics and Engineering for her postdoctoral research resolving a fundamental problem in underwater computer vision, the reconstructions of lost colors and contrast, which led to the development of the see-through algorithm. She currently works, as I mentioned earlier, at the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce, Florida, but uh, she's about to uh, start her own laboratory in Elat, Israel. Daria, welcome to C Secret. Thank you very much, Tina Visar. Good afternoon, everyone. I will go ahead and share my screen. Invite you to join me on exploring why there are colors in the ocean. Here's how today's talk will go. I will tell you very briefly about my background to add to what Tina Visar said. And then I'll spend five minutes talking about things I actually won't be talking about today, which are some visual ecology projects I'm working on. And then I'll move on to 
the core of today's talk, which is why are there colors in the ocean? What do colors mean? Can colors give us scientific insights? And why is consistent imaging of colors underwater such a hard problem? Then I'll move on to telling you my contributions towards the solution of this problem, namely a new equation for the ocean and a new algorithm for the ocean. So let's get started. Today I'm speaking to you as an oceanographer, but actually I'm an aerospace engineer by training. I was born and raised in Turkey and that's where I got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering. After I graduated from my university, I got a master's degree in aerospace at MIT. But at that time, I was working on thermodynamic efficiencies of aircraft engines, and I did not feel very passionately about that. So I took a job in finance, in consulting, and for a while, traveled well, ate well, uh, made good money. That was up until 2008. And 2008 was a particularly memorable year to be working in finance. But even before that, actually, I was quite unhappy because I was spending many long hours in the office looking at a computer so long that year after year, I had started to miss the changing of the seasons. And the sea had become something that I could only see two weeks a year on vacation. So I stopped and I said, what is a job that I can do that will put the sea in my life every day? So the next year I started a PhD in oceanography again at MIT and MIT has a joint program with Woods Hole Oceanographic. I finished in 2014 and I never looked back. I did a number of postdocs after that. I worked in Panama. I worked in Germany, I worked at Princeton, I worked in Israel, and most recently I am at Harbor Branch as a research scientist. And as Dean Avisar said, Harbor Branch is just up the coast from you guys, from University of Miami, about two hours. And we are a part of Florida Atlantic University. We have a beautiful campus where on any given day you can see a number of manatees in our canal. I remember on one very cold day, I counted 41. And of course, before the pandemic, it was possible to tour our campus, see our labs. Um, and I hope all of that will resume uh, in a short time. But until then, you can check out our website. We also have a public talk series. You can sign up for our newsletter and learn about the research going on at Harbor Branch. Myself, coming from such an indirect uh, path to oceanography, my research uh, is very multi and interdisciplinary. Most often I find myself working at the intersection of ocean optics, computer vision and visual ecology. And working in ocean optics means that I am also working in biogeochemistry, which relates to what's in the water column. And now I want to take just a few minutes to tell you about two of my ongoing visual ecology projects, namely on cuttlefish camouflage and sea turtle color vision. I'm going to start by showing you my most favorite video. And I have no doubt you have seen this video a number of times in a number of venues. It's very popular. It was taken by my PhD co-advisor, Dr. Roger Hanlon. And as I play the video, just keep looking at the rock. As the camera gets closer to the rock, just keep looking at the rock. And soon enough, you see that the rock is not a rock actually, but it is an octopus. Octopus have this tremendous ability within milliseconds to change their appearance and blend in with their surroundings and fool the eyes of the observers looking at them. Now we'll see it play backwards in slow motion and look at the part between the eyes. That's where the brain is and the camouflage is expanding 
on the skin from that point. And soon you'll see that it's not just a simple color match, but there is also a resemblance of pattern and there's even resemblance of texture. The octopus can change its skin from two dimensional to three dimensional. But what I find the most fascinating about the ability of these animals is not that they can do this within a matter of milliseconds, but that they can do this being colorblind. So cuttlefish, of course, who are cousins of octopus like squid are also colorblind and they also have the ability to dynamically and adaptively change their body patterns. And I've been working with these animals in the lab and in the wild for more than 10 years now. And in this most recent experiment, I give them different backgrounds, very artificial backgrounds like checkerboard, sine waves, cow patterns, and I put them in an arena with these backgrounds and I time lapse them. From the time they go into the arena to the time they find peace and settle and display a stable camouflage pattern, I time lapse them. And the goal here is to understand what the known background statistics that we have can tell us about the final pattern that these animals decide to display. And the one on the sine wave actually never found peace in this experiment. The second project I want to tell you about briefly is on a very interesting evolutionary adaptation for better color vision. We as humans, we have trichromatic vision. So we have three color cones in our eyes. And these are sensitive to roughly what we call the red, green, and blue parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Turtles, actually both sea turtles and freshwater turtles are tetrachromatic, which means they have four color cones. And the fourth one is sensitive to ultraviolet light, which we are not sensitive to. But in addition to that, turtles, both marine and freshwater, also have these interesting elements in their eyes called oil droplets. So here is the retina of a green sea turtle and the red, yellow, red and orange spheres you see there are colored oil droplets which are scattered all across the retina and they're sitting on top of the turtle's cone photoreceptor. So the photoreceptors that we also have, they also have those, but on top is, are these spherical colored oil droplets. Now, birds also have these oil droplets and theoretical models suggest that for birds, the role of these oil droplets in color vision for birds is enhanced color discrimination. Of course, that makes a lot of sense because birds are very colorful. They live in terrestrial habitats where there's a lot of sunlight and sunlight with a broadband spectrum, which means every color in the rainbow is visible, is possible. And it makes a lot of sense for birds to have these elements in their visual system that would help them have better color discrimination, that would help them see more colors. But turtles, no offense, are not that colorful, right? And on top of that, the habitats in which they live, in other words, the ocean, get duller and duller. The colors become duller and duller with depth and distance because of the way light changes in the water. So the possibility to see more colors is less for turtles. So what is the advantage for turtles to have evolved and kept these oil droplets? That's what I wanted to understand. And to do that, it would help to see the underwater world like a turtle. But we cannot look at the underwater world or we cannot look at what the underwater world looks like to a turtle using cameras that are developed for the human visual system. So we had to engineer, design, and build a brand new camera, a hyperspectral camera, which we called the turtle eye camera, 
that is sensitive to not three, but 16 bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. And around the 16 band sensor, we built an entire camera with the Linux computer, with a battery pack that lasts about four hours, which is about two dives, and put everything in a housing that's rated to 100 meters. And you see here the turtle eye camera in its first dive. This camera doesn't take photos as we think of photos, but it, co it collects a data cube, which we later process according to the visual system of the animal we're interested in. And that's the fun part here. Now you are looking at the footage collected by the hyperspectral turtle eye camera on the left rendered with the visual system of an actual sea turtle which has oil droplets and on the right with the visual system of a hypothetical sea turtle which doesn't have oil droplets. And even though I just said the underwater world is not that colorful, we can still see that there is a benefit to having oil droplets and you can still see, sense more colors than you otherwise would. And what does this mean for the life of the turtle? I can't answer that yet. This is a simply an engineering solution, simulation of a turtle visual system, but we'll get there slowly. So that's actually the first part of my talk where I briefly wanted to show you what somebody who came from an aerospace background all the way to oceanography might be working on. And now I'll move to the main part of my talk today. What do colors in the ocean mean? And can colors give us scientific insights? So I'll start with the answer. Yes, of course. The ocean colors and the colors of natural bodies of water around the world can absolutely give us insights about what's in the water column. Natural bodies of water around the globe show tremendous variability in the dominant color they have and the visibility. And these two things together tell us what's, what are the constituents in the water column and how they change across time. And actually, at least since late 1800s, scientists and sailors have been trying to connect the color of the ocean water to the particles in the water body. And they've been collecting water samples, developing scales to judge, to rate the colors in a consistent way. And you can imagine trying to sample water color from a ship you can imagine the size of the ocean and you can imagine how impossible of a task it would be to make sense of the big picture just by collecting water samples around the globe. So it was only when we were able to sense the color of the ocean from space that the true scientific value of water color came out. What I'm showing you here is a map from that was published in 1989 that shows in a fake color coding the color of the ocean water globally for the first time. And it took about 10 years to make that map. Now, the color of the ocean water for the most part tells us how much phytoplankton there is in the water. And phytoplankton are tiny microscopic organisms that photosynthesize and produce food for everything else in the ocean to eat. And their concentration changes the color of the water. So if we can sense, measure, photograph that concentration, that color, then we can have an idea about the concentration of these important organisms. And this map from 1989 was the first time we were able to do that and it really revolutionized oceanography. Of course, today we can do that on a daily basis from instruments that we have on satellites that show us the diversity and the variability of ocean color. And if you look at the structures, the eddies, the rings, the plumes, nothing in the ocean varies smoothly as scientists 200 years ago or sailors would have thought having collected two samples at two discrete locations. So it is through the ability to see the ocean from space at large scales 
that the value of color has come out. So to quickly summarize, and here's a beautiful simulation of ocean color, which is an indication of how much phytoplankton there is, which changes geographically. It changes across time and small time scales and large time scales. The color of the ocean water can give us tremendous scientific insights. It tells us about the concentration of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton, of course, photosynthesize. And photosynthesis means food. That's very important for us to know. But photosynthesis also means carbon dioxide. And knowing how much carbon dioxide is used is extremely important for us to understand the role of the ocean in the planet's climate. However, some people would argue, and I might be one of them, that the fact that the ocean water has color is a huge problem because it hides the color of everything else in the ocean. And I personally want to know why does anything in the ocean have color? Who is looking at it and what does it mean? And water and the color of the water is a huge obstacle for me. So what do I mean when I say color? Let me take a moment and clarify. Color actually is a subjective sensation defined entirely for the human visual system. It's not a scientific term. It's a subjective term that changes from person to person. But if we were to express this mathematically, we could say it as the interaction between the reflectance of a surface, which is its physical color, which does not change with the ambient light. It's the interaction of the physical properties of a surface, its reflectance, with the ambient light. So color changes according to if you have an LED light on or if you have sunlight on, as we would buy a certain sensor. And here the sensor could be the human visual system or it could be a camera. It's already complicated enough, so I'm going to make a simplification for the rest of my talk. And I'm going to assume every time I talk about color, I'm going to be talking about the same sensor, the same visual system looking at that color. And this sensor is going to be an ideal sensor that responds to each color equally. So we can assume it has no effect on what I'm seeing. So I'm going to kick sensor out of this equation. Now we are left with a simpler definition of color, which basically says, what is the reflectance of a surface under the certain color of the ocean water at the time and location where you are at? So ocean color comes in as the ambient light into the equation of color. We have to remember that because everything depends on ambient light. So from now on, when I say I want to see the true colors of everything in the ocean, what I'm really saying is I want to see the reflectance of everything in the ocean without the color of the ocean water biasing it. After that, I want to give you a very brief introduction to how an image for is formed underwater, how a photograph is captured, how is it formed, how are those colors captured in your camera sensor. We have a diver and he wants to take a photo of this octopus. The diver's photo will be an addition of three different photos on top of each other. The first photo will be the actual photo of the octopus which he wants to take, which is the part that we want to maximize. On top of that, there will be a second layer, which will be the sunlight that comes from the surface. It reaches the skin of the octopus, and then it reflects from the skin of the octopus, and then bounces, scatters from these really exaggerated particles that I scattered in the, in the animation here, and then find their way back to the camera. This second layer of image is going to be a blurry version of the octopus photo. It's going to be a degrading layer. We don't want that. But it's not the biggest problem. The biggest problem 
is the sunlight that will come from the sun, penetrate the surface, and then it will scatter from these exaggerated floating particles without ever going to the octopus, instead directly scattering to the camera sensor. The layer that will be formed from these scattered particles is going to be a layer of colored fog. It's just going to be a occluding layer that will reduce the quality of the photograph. Now, I will not talk about the part with the yellow arrows, which is called forest scatter. For the rest of my talk, we can ignore that. But I will refer to this, the photo layer that is with the blue arrow direct, coming directly from the octopus and reaching the camera as the direct layer. And I will refer to this occluding layer of fog that is formed by light that never reaches the octopus as backscatter. And the most important takeaway from this slide is that everything about color loss, everything about image formation depends on the distance between the camera and the octopus. The distance between you and the scene determines the quality of your image. What do I mean by that? Let me show you with a different animation. Here's the diver on the bottom right of the screen again. And this time he wants to take a photo of the color chart, which is right above the starfish. Where he is now, he's too far. When he takes a photo, the direct signal, in other words, the signal that should have been the color chart will be nearly zero. And the backscatter, that layer of fog will dominate the image. Only when he gets a little bit closer and takes another image, the direct signal the signal that represents the scene is going to start being non-zero and the backscattered signal, that layer of fog is gonna get weaker. And finally, only when he is right up to the color chart and the distance between him and the color chart is minimal, his photo will most consistently resemble the color chart and that layer of fog will be minimal. So the takeaway here is if you want to take good photos underwater, if you want to take photos that will be easy to correct later, get close to your subject. Everything gets worse with distance. The layer of fog grows exponentially with distance and colors are lost exponentially with distance. Now that I've shown you this simulation, I want to show you a real example. I mounted a color chart in the middle of the sea on a buoy and I went back about eight meters. Eight meters is about 26 feet. And from eight meters to 30 centimeters, which is about a foot, I got closer to it and I took a photo. And from left to right, you see the raw unedited photos of this color chart that I took. So here, if you look at the farthest one, you see very clearly that the scene is occluded with fog, that the sharpness is low, the contrast is low, and only when you get very close to the chart, we, that, that fog is reduced. Just to show you what the scene looks like without that fog, I have processed these images to take the fog out. And that's the second row. Now compare the second row to the first row that backscatter, that occluding layer of fog is now gone. We only have what I've been calling the direct signal, which is the signal that represents the scene. The fog is gone and compare the sharpness between the first row and the second row, especially for the faraway charts. The fog really makes a difference. Now I'm gonna put the colors back again by doing a computation in the background. And you can see that each color chart at each distance can be consistently corrected. So just to put everything into perspective, the problem of color reconstruction, that very hard problem is essentially the following. When you are given an image with distorted colors and attenuated colors, can you recover the unattenuated version, the unoccluded version 
of that scene without any other information. And maybe at this point you're thinking, well, can't I do that with white balance? The answer is no, for two reasons. One is the layer of fog I just mentioned. If you have an occluding layer of fog and you white balance it, you just change the layer of the, the color of the fog. You have to subtract it. White balance won't fix that. But there's another reason, and that is I'm going to demonstrate to you with the five color charts I have laid out in this scene. Actually, there's a sixth one being held by a diver at the back of the scene. Each of these color charts has a white patch. And when we segment that white patch and put them side by side, you can see that the white is different at every distance. So which white are you going to white balance with? Under, in 99% of the cases underwater, we cannot use white balancing to fix the colors. Unfortunately, this is a much harder problem than uh, photography in air. Of course, folks who work on color correction algorithms know this, so they develop algorithms that take into account or try to estimate the distance to each pixel. Yet still, the majority of those color reconstruction algorithms fail in three common ways. The most common way they fail is they don't fix the colors, they just change the colors. So this image is not better than the original. The second most common way is they do a great job improving the visibility. So in this case, we can see actually much clearer to the fifth chart all the way back, but it came at the expense of distorted colors. So it's the colors are washed out, they are overblown, some shades are wrong. So it didn't work either. And the third mode is Colors can be corrected reasonably okay for the pixels close to the camera, but generally the red colors are overcompensated and pixels far away from the camera are not fixed at all. So why is this happening? I mean, we are in year 2021. We have very expensive cameras, cell phones with crazy algorithms in them. Why aren't our cameras already able to capture a photo that has fixed, corrected, reconstructed colors in underwater scenes? Why isn't this happening? To give you the answer, I'll take you back 200 years. 200 years ago is when the first photograph, as we know photographs today, was taken. And much, not much long after, only 30 years after, the first underwater photograph was taken by putting a camera in a big enclosure and lowering it down. And by 1911, the first measurement of sunlight spectrum at depth underwater was made. That's a big deal. And after the First World War, we mapped out the physics of visibility in the atmosphere. After the Second World War, a bunch of the secret work that was done on visibility underwater continued in the public domain. And notably, Siebert Dunkley, who had established the visibility lab at MIT, then moved it to Scripps, started to work on underwater visibility. Of course, after that came the first underwater camera, the Calypso. After that, in 1963, Siebert Dantley, again from the Visibility Lab, published his seminal paper called Light in the Sea, which today we still reference. 1975 was the invention of the digital camera. Many of us have never even used a camera that wasn't digital. Between 75 and 80, the first computer simulation of an underwater scene was made also at the visibility lab. This simulation was refined later in the 1990s. And here comes the most important event. 1999, Sri Nayar and Srinivas Narasimhan published their very famous paper called Computer Vision in Bad Weather. And what they did in this paper is they took a very complicated equation that describes how light moves. And they simplified it for the conditions of the atmosphere. And they simplified it for the conditions of an RGB camera. 
which became known as the atmospheric image formation model. And for the next 20 years, folks used the atmospheric image formation model for underwater images. Let's think about that for a second. What does that mean to use something made for the atmosphere for the ocean? It's not a good idea because the way light is changed in the atmosphere is fundamentally different than how it's changed in the ocean. Just by comparing a photo taken in fog in the atmosphere and in the ocean, we could see that wasn't a good idea. But it took us all the way to 2018 to realize that and derive a new equation for the ocean. That's the equation. And it's the first image formation model for the ocean. It's a lot more complicated than the atmospheric one. It's more difficult to solve. And all of that explains why previous color reconstruction algorithms were unstable and inappropriate. And this is really good news for the ocean because it has opened the door for a lot of innovations. But to me, that's not the best part of the story. It was two women engineers from the Middle East who loved the ocean so much that they steered their lives and their careers to the ocean and eventually met who got to tackle the old atmospheric equation. To me, that's the best part of the story. But you can have the most accurate equation you want, and until you translate it into something practical, it's still not useful. So the next year, Dr. Trebitz and I used our new equation, turned it into a method, and found a way to undo the de degrading effects of water to underwater photographs. So that's the see-through algorithm, which I'm going to walk you through very briefly. And it's the first method out there to use the equation that was derived specifically for the ocean. And I can't emphasize enough, it's not an AI algorithm. And it doesn't need to know anything about the water to work. And it does not need a color chart to work either. It works agnostic to anything in the scene. Even though it's not an AI algorithm, it will mark the start of the AI boom in marine science because it removes that variable color of the water from photographs and it removes that layer of fog. After everything I've said, let's look at that together. Since we're in Florida, most of us, I'm starting with a scene from the Florida Keys. Here's an original photograph we took in the Florida Keys. And here you see the light and the colors standardized by the see-through algorithm. One of my favorite photos from Papua New Guinea from the Pacific Ocean. You cannot see the diversity of life in this photo until you standardize the light and you look at the ridiculous colors in it. Here's a scene from the Red Sea. Again, everything's blue. There's no color contrast. AI cannot find what it's looking for in a scene like this very easily. But if the light is standardized, then we can tell what's what and we can do that in a consistent manner. Here's a final scene from Indonesia that actually looks like a rainforest. And of course, there is nothing that limits us to seawater. This algorithm, because it's based on physics, can also work in any water body. Here you see an outdoor pool from Davis, California. And not only you see the color of the bathing suits of the swimmers, but also their skin tones reproduced. So I hope I haven't misled you. This is the Sea Secrets series. So to me, it's still a secret why there are colors in the ocean. And finally, we have a new tool that can consistently capture colors in the ocean. So we can start asking this new question. Why are these colors there? On land, the colorful parts of the ecosystems are generally the flowers, the flowering parts, and they are tuned to the disperses, the animals that are looking at them. 
in the ocean, the colorful parts happen to be animals themselves. So we have a very new and different setup that we can now start thinking about. And that actually brings me to the end of my talk. I, as Dean Avisar said, I'm opening my lab at the end of this year. And if you're interested in investigating why there are colors in the ocean, please contact me. I'm looking for students and postdocs starting this year and next. And together, hopefully, we can understand what this diversity of color represents, to whose eyes that are looking at these colors, and what it means for our planet. That's all I had today. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. Very, very interesting presentation. What a great way to complete this season of Sea Secret. There you are. We really appreciate your, your, your presentation. It was not only a, a very interesting from a scientific point of view, but you delivered that beautifully. Very interesting. And as you Thank point you. out, uh, having two women engineers, uh, being able to make this uh, literally a revolution is absolutely fantastic. So congratulations. And again, thank you so much for participating. I want to thank you. I want to thank the audience again for participating in this evening presentation, as well as the entire series. Please keep in touch with us. You can contact us for the C secret. And uh, again, I believe that the email to contact us is going to be provided. Keep in touch to uh, see what is going to be offered in uh, 2022. And uh, we do have uh, time for about 10, 12 minutes of questions. And I am going to, uh, with your authorization, Dr. Uh, uh, Akenak, uh, I'm going to uh, transfer that to um, uh, our communication people that are going to help you monitor that. So again, thank you so much and uh, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. We, we have some questions coming in. One in particular was, how did the cuttlefish get clues about which background to replicate? Well, we have to ask them. <laughs> they, uh, as soon as they hatch, they know how to camouflage. And which clues are they picking up? There have been many studies on that, but with my very artificial backgrounds, I don't know the answer yet. So that's going to be a while before I can answer that question. Uh, Anna Sophia wanted to know, how are you able to subtract the backscatter? Do you need a special software to process images? So that's part of what see-through does. It has a way of estimating the distance between the photographer and the scene. Actually, by design, it has to know that distance. And once you know that distance, because we know the physics, we know how that backscatter should change. We are able to estimate it and subtract it. I'd be happy to provide, uh, if they can send me an email, I'd be happy to provide more uh, explanations on that later. Excellent. Uh, many of the comments that are coming in are messages of congratulations. Very interesting. So glad we attended. Um, we have a question here from Sirdar, Sirdar uh, who is asking, can the see-through algorithm be applied in real time, uh, such as on a video stream? As long as we have a way of estimating distance, which is the computationally heavy part of the calculation, the color correction can be done real time. And we are working on doing that real time. Yes, that's a good question. So a couple questions about how sea turtles see. One was if they can see infrared light, would it be beneficial to have uh, red lights at, in the evening when they're um, uh, looking at nests for sea turtle hatchings and those types of things. And also the other part of that question was, uh, what extra information do they see since they're able to see UV light? Excellent questions. And I know from Florida folks, we were going to get questions like these with thousands of sea, her sea turtle nests every year. So as for the first question, infrared, they cannot sense, but red light and amber light they can. So there is really no such thing as turtle friendly light. If you want to have light that's invisible to the turtles, you need darkness. Infrared, however, they cannot sense, but also humans can't sense infrared. So it doesn't make sense to use infrared as an outdoor light on your beach, patio, 
um, because you can't see it and the turtles can't see it. So uh, that's, that's very important. Lights should be as dim as possible for to be turtle friendly. And the second question was what, Diana? Um, in, in terms of the UV, I think you answered it, the UV light since sea turtles see UV light, what extra information do they see? Ah, so there are a lot of animals that sense UV light. You know, for example, hummingbirds do, many birds do. It's, it's not that they sense something special that maybe we don't necessarily sense, but they just have better color resolution and discrimination. So for turtles, UV and UV blue, they that may give them, I don't know, but I'm hypothesizing that that may give them better color discrimination, for example, for a jellyfish against a blue background or something against a green background. So, um, and more congratulatory messages. Here's one that says from Hope is asking, what keeps you up at night with regards to our oceans? Climate crisis, Hope. I can not get over how we are not talking about the climate emergency every day and how we keep living what I consider inefficient and wasteful lives that generate so much carbon dioxide and use so much single use disposable plastic and how that is pushed to us as if that's okay. That keeps me up at night. Elva Escobar wants to uh, mentions here that ROVs, ROV cameras at the start of the transects arriving the seafloor white balance, check for full black and then have a color scale for red, green, and blue. Does that help? If they are imaging the seafloor from a very close distance, they're not gonna have that problem of fog between them and the seafloor. In those cases, that may help, yes. So that's one of the very few cases where white balancing is a good solution because you are close and everything's at the same distance and there's no fog, so that can work, yes. Um, so a couple questions, one from Rick Reynolds who says, bravo, how soon do you think it will be before our undersea documentaries can use the algorithm to bring all of these colors into the films? Thanks so much for, uh, for your work. Um, and Ken is saying, when might your formulas make it into commercially available underwater cameras to self-correct? Those are excellent questions. We get these all the time. I wish uh, my colleague Tali Trebich was here because she at the University of Haifa is leading that effort of commercializing see-through. She has a great team of engineers working on bringing that to the market. It's not gonna be quick because it's a very hard problem. And to go from an academic algorithm to a product that everybody can use in any situation is not easy, but there are great folks working on that right now and hopefully soon, but I don't know when. Hanuman wants to know, can you apply the algorithm to historical photos to deduct properties of the water from that photo example, like turbidity and phytoplankton levels? That's an excellent question. It really depends on whether we can estimate scene distance in that scene. And if it's an older photo, that's a bit hard. If there were multiple photos of the scene, yes, we could do that. If it was a single photo, with this technique, we cannot, but that's not to say we will never be able to. I imagine there's going to be AI that's going to be able to do that in no time, but just not yet. So we have several questions from uh, asking if undergraduate students can work as your intern. So um, we might want to share your email <laughs> with yes, that. Please do, definitely, definitely. Okay. And I want to, Deanna, I want to make sure that uh, I, for my lab, that might be very idealistic. I want to have a paid internship program. So my interns will receive a salary and hopefully we'll do great things together. Excellent. Um, uh, Jeff is saying, I would like my photos to look the same as how I perceive the scene underwater with my eyes. How is that best achieved? Actually, phenomenal question because the way we see the scene with our eyes when we're in the water is actually different than what the camera captures because our eyes sense something and our brain compensates for that blueness or that greenness of the light. Mm -hmm. The camera doesn't do that, not in a way that's uh, effective like the humans. So actually when we are in the water, we do see the scene rather better than the photos we take home. Is there a depth limit 
with the see-through see algorithm? Could you use it in deep, deep ocean? Excellent question. Right now, the equation it uses is for natural light. So if there is no natural light, then because we rely on the physics, we cannot put back the light. You know, if you are at 100 meters depth that it's black, we cannot invent light and light up the scene. There is no algorithm, there is no equivalent of see-through for artificial light yet. Me and others are working on that, but that's a bit of a harder problem. So not yet, not see-through, not when it's dark. So a couple of people want to know why the one cuttlefish that was on the wavy lane, the wavy lines pattern never quite settled down. Because that was a very challenging background. There is nothing that looks like a sine wave in nature. And this was the first time it was seeing it. I can only imagine the torture, the, the pain I was causing the animal. Uh, it tried and tried and tried, but very unnatural. Um, so, so folks are probably maybe wondering, so can this not be done with Photoshop? <laughs> yes, my favorite question. You can do everything in Photoshop, but if you're a marine scientist that comes home from a dive with 10,000 photos, or if you are the lucky intern who has to go through 30,000 photos that your AUV took on an expedition before, you cannot do that one by one. So this sort of speeds up the process. And also, even if you were going to do all 30,000 in Photoshop, there is no tool yet that will subtract the backscatter, the layer of fog. You can change the colors, but you cannot subtract that fog. So right now you cannot do it in Photoshop. Excellent. Well, a lot of, a lot more congratulations uh, messages coming in. This, this presentation has been recorded and we will share it on our YouTube channel. Um, let's see, Chuk says, absolutely mind blowing. Thank you so much. I think this will be the future of underwater camera. Would love to read your articles before asking more questions. So if there's links that you can share with us and we'll put them in for any of your publications, that would be um, great to share with the audience as well. Definitely, uh, there is a research link on my website. I don't know if we can share that. I can share that after we're done and the relevant papers are up there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, so George St. Clair wants to know, uh, while it may be easier to determine cuttlefish that change skin color or as environmental colors change, uh, sensing of colors, how do we know what colors animals like turtles sense? How do we know? Well, the beginning is not very romantic because eventually we have to look in the eye of the turtle. So that means we sacrifice an animal, we cut open the eye and we look, up the, look at the retina and we stimulate the cells in the retina to see what parts of the spectrum they are sensitive to. So that's basically how we know. Excellent. And we are right on 7.30. So um, with that, uh, if there's, we, I know we like to end on time, but there will be opportunities right now, I think is a good time. Uh, Daria, if you wanna say, uh, share in the chat box your, um, your email address and your link to your papers that folks can read a little bit more. Uh, sure. we'll, we'll allow a minute or two for that so folks can collect that information. So both my email and my um, website and on the home page of my website, there is a link for the papers called research. So you can, you can find all the papers there. All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been a really interesting talk and uh, to our audience that has uh, followed us all season. Thank you for your, uh, for following us and attending our talks. Stay tuned. There will be forthcoming information for our 2022 series. All right. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you so much, Daria. Thank you, Diana. Bye-bye everyone. Have all a good right. night.